Isn't it a wonderful day? It's truly another wonderful day to be gathered around as brothers and sisters in the Lord, forming a circle around Jesus. Because Jesus is preeminent and Jesus is the center of our circle. He's the center of prophecy. And yes, he's the center of our lives and the center of our heart. And I welcome you this morning as we come to enjoy the Holy Communion, the breaking of bread. What have we to offer ourselves? That's the beauty of the Christian life. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. He paid a debt he didn't owe. And he said on the cross, it is finished. And so for us, it's simply showing up. It's simply availing ourselves and making ourselves available to him and to his bidding. And what a wonderful morning to all of you. My heartfelt love to each and one of you as we come together Today's topic, today's sermon is called 153. Some of you may be thinking, well, what is that all about? Well, I pray the Holy Spirit will illuminate us, encourage us, and just fill us more of Jesus. That's what we need in our life. That's what, that's what the world is missing today is Jesus. You know, there's so many formulas, there's so many agendas, there's so much chitter-chatter, there's so much misinformation, there's so much evil that's going on in the world today. And what we need more today, and what the world needs more today, is Jesus. And I pray that our time together today will refill our tank to the brim with Jesus. I'm reading from the 21st chapter of John. That's the Gospel of John, the 21st chapter. Won't you turn with me? And let's read together a few verses together. We're going to approach this in a very different way. I think it's going to give us some very interesting insight in the love of Jesus. We need to be reminded again and again, of the love of Jesus. What also happens so often is that we go, we get caught up with the news, mortgage payments, the toxicity of other people, our, all, our own miserable failures at times, the betrayal of other people. We just get caught up with so much and that is Satan's way of just taking our eyes off of Jesus. And what Jesus wants us to do is, don't go there. Don't look there. Don't focus there. Just focus on me. And isn't that where we fail the most? Just focusing on Jesus? Isn't that how we got saved? Isn't that how we got born again? Isn't that how we fell in, G- fell in love with Jesus the very first time? We just gazed upon him and his brilliance and his beauty and his majesty and his nobility and his love for us captured our hearts. Let us again refocus our minds, our hearts, our souls on Jesus. Amen. So here we go. John 21, verse 1. After these things, what things? What is John talking about? Well, Jesus at the Last Supper really blew them all away with this concept of this blessing of the new covenant. They still don't understand it. It was a radical departure from the Passover. 
they are no longer following Judaism. He has done something different now. He's calling it the new. Are you in the, in the in the new covenant or are you in the old covenant? After these things, the betrayal. Oh, how betrayal stings. Mm. Painful. To have the treasure, have Judas. He was, he was, he was with them for three and a half years. He was part of the healing process. He was healing people. He was preaching the gospel. He was exercising demons. Ah, how that must have hurt. Ah, and yes, the betrayal of Peter. You know, it's great to have a captain of the team. But when the captain of the team just completely just bonks, I mean, bonks bad. I mean, he eats dirt. It's confusion. After these things, the passion. We must never forget the passion. We must never forget the death. We must never forget the resurrection, the vindication of Jesus after these things. And then the appearance of Jesus. And also, the, it's, it's the absence of Jesus. Jesus is no longer with them 24-7. He's making these appearances and then he disappears. Things are so different. So when he says, after these things, take note that so much has happened to them in a relatively short period of time. Also know that the Sanhedrin is on the hunt. They're looking for Peter. They're looking for John. They're looking for the disciples. <laughs> this cracks me up. I apologize. So please forgive me. But these pundits and these neoliberals and these fancy dancy academics, they make things too complicated in the Bible. I've said it once. I'll say it again. The Bible is for simple people. The, the Bible is for common people like you and me. Think about it. There were wonderful women that supplied funding for the living, for the daily needs of Jesus and his disciples. Where are they now? So understand what it says after these things, that funding, that money dried up. So understand that a lot of things have happened. And it's a time of stress. It's a time of great joy. Jesus is resurrected. There's a lot of question marks. And whenever there's question marks, what does Jesus do? Jesus showed himself again. Do you have question marks in your life today? Step aside. Give a chance for Jesus to show up. It says Jesus showed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now notice, he told Mary for the disciples to go to Galilee and he will meet them there. So they're being obedient and they have left Jerusalem and they're now in Galilee. So that the disciples are being obedient. Now many people say, well, Peter was wrong. He, he was wrong in telling everyone to go fishing again. But we, don't, we can't say that. We don't know the attitude of Peter. All we do know is that they weren't fishing here for a hobby. They were hungry. They needed food. And so Peter made a decision and said, I'm going to go fishing. Now, let's see who's there. We have Simon Peter. Oh, all of a sudden now he's friends with Thomas. I guess they have something in common. Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee. Don't underestimate Cana of Galilee, the first two miracles in the Bible. And then John very cleverly puts the sons of Zebedee. And then there's two disciples who are not mentioned at all. So all of them, the 11, are not all together. We've got seven, but not the 11. But that's okay. And they all got together. And they need to eat. And, G and Simon says, I go a-fishing. 
And they say, we will also go with you. Now notice that there's a, lo a lack of purpose here. They're not sure what to do. There's uncertainty. Is there a lack of purpose in your life? Is there uncertainty in your life? That's okay. Jesus will address that. And so they went forth. Look at these words. They went forth. They entered into a ship. And immediately, I mean, they did this right away. And that night, they caught nothing. A big, fat zero. Zippo. Nada. Niet. I love verse 4. But, I encourage any of our scholars who are writing their theses for their PhD doctor program, that would be a great thesis to write about the great buts, no joke intended, the great but, buts of the Old and New Testament. But when the morning was come, yeah, that's, that's how Jesus works. Jesus always comes at the morning. It's a new beginning, a new day, a new dawn. That's what Jesus wants for you and for, and for me to divorce the past and just start off anew with him. And where do we find Jesus? He's standing on the shore. Do you know that Jesus is always watching us? We see in Revelation that Jesus is in the midst of the church. He's always watching the church. He's ever vigilant over the church. Jesus is watching you. He cares about you. He's ever vigilant on you. And he stood on the church. I'm sorry, stood at the shore but the, the disciples knew not was it, knew not that it was Jesus. You see, Jesus reveals himself, but he reveals himself in his own way. We cannot reveal Jesus. Jesus reveals himself in his own way, in his own time, through the Holy Spirit. Isn't it amazing that God always seeks us. We don't always seek God, but God always seeks us. And God always speaks to us. We don't always speak to God, but he's always seeking us, and he's always trying to speak to us. So they didn't know it was Jesus on the shore. Now listen to this in verse 5. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? And they answered, No. Now, I'm so, I'm so glad because in our family time, we're studying the Bible together with my wife and my children. And I'm so glad that my children have learned to use the interlinear Bible. It's so easy to use. It's on the internet. And the Strong's Concordance. This word children in the Greek is paideon, which means lads. It's like, lads, have you any meat? So he's coming across like he's trying to buy some fish from them. He's like, he notices that they're fishing, and he's wondering, hey, did you catch any fish? I'd, I'd buy some fish from you. That's how Jesus is coming across here. Now, verse 6. And Jesus said unto them, now this is where things get different. We have to learn in our life. There are times where we have divine guidance. And unfortunately, there are many other times where we do things without divine guidance. Obviously, they went fishing without divine guidance. But now Jesus is going to give them that holy, blessed, divine guidance. And he says to them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you will find. And they cast, therefore... And now, that's, that's, the, that's the word I would circle, now. You see, what God wants for you, what Jesus wants for you is, let go of the past. Stop hanging on to the past. Those memories, that negative self-talk, those painful memories of the past, let them go. Empty your cup. Empty your cup. God can't fill your cup to overflowing if it's filled up with the things of the past. Empty your cup. Drain your cup out. Release. Release. 
you know, there's sometimes so much bitterness and pain and bad memories of the past that it prevents us from assimilating and absorbing the new blessings that God wants to give to us now. We must forgive, and we must forget. And so they cast there for now, and now, and now they're unable to draw for the multitude of fishes. Notice the difference. The last time in Luke 5, they caught so much fish that the net break. Even with two ships, they couldn't handle the blessing of the Lord. Here, they're catching a multitude of fish. The difference is the net is not going to break. See, my friend, God wants to bless you in a way that the net will never break. You will enjoy all the blessings. Before the crucifixion, blessings would come, and you would not be able to fully contain it. But now, after the crucifixion, God wants to fully bless you in so many ways, and your net is not going to break if you allow the divine guidance. Now, verse 7 is very, very telling here. It says here, Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, why did John say that? Because he got it right. He knew he couldn't have the love for Jesus the way that he wanted to. Hmm. That's deep insight. That's probably another message. John realized and had the insight that he didn't have it within himself to love Jesus the way he ought to. But he knew that Jesus loved him. So that's what he says here. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He wasn't trying to say that he was more loved than the rest. No, what he's trying to say is, there's no way that he could have loved Jesus the way that Jesus loved him. And he said unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter, notice those two names are together, Simon Peter. Simon Peter is having this conflict. The old man with the new man. The old Simon with the new Peter. Oftentimes we have that conflict. That's why I encourage you. Let go of the old man. Let go of the old person and renew that new man in Jesus Christ. Be ye transformed by the, new, the renewing of the word. Romans 12. I love how honest the Bible is. It really shows us how real these people are and how it relates to us. When Simon Peter, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. We're going to explain that. And he did cast himself in the sea. So let's explain that. Was Peter really naked? No. There's something in the Greek and also in the Latin which is called subliaglum, which means your loincloth or your underwear. So Peter is the one who instigated and said, let's go fishing. And he's the one who's working the hardest. He took off his coat, he took off his robe, and he's rowing the boat as hard as he can. And he's doing his lo in his loincloth, which is very common when you're really serious about fishing. And obviously he was working the hardest because he wanted everyone to catch fish. Now, John got to the tomb first. And so he knew that Jesus got resurrected before Peter. And now John is recognizing that it's Peter, that it's Jesus on the shore. This is the second time that John is recognizing Jesus before Peter. Peter's getting a little competitive here. So it may be now that this third time John is recognizing Peter. I mean, I'm sorry, that John is recognizing Jesus. But Peter is going to be now the first one He's going to try his best to recognize and give recognition to Jesus. And he dives himself right into the sea. Verse 8. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, for it was about 200 cubits. Well, a cubit is about 1.5 feet. You do the math, so it was about 300 feet offshore. 
and they were dragging the net with the fishes. Now look at the beauty here. This is where this is where you get blessed. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals. That's one. And the fish and the bread. You see, they were looking for food. They were looking for substance. They were looking for for every, all the requirements of life. And they tried it on their own, and they couldn't find it. And they failed. Hmm? We all fail. We don't admit it. Oh, some of us have egos as big as the Himalayas. It's okay to say that we failed. And here they show up to Jesus. He's the king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And he has already prepared breakfast for them. He, he started a fire. I don't know how he got the fish. It doesn't say. And he also brought bread. And so we see that he's already prepared breakfast. Now look how humble Jesus is. Look how, how servant-like he is. Look how, how much he treats them like brothers. What king is like this? And Jesus said unto them, bring of the fish which you have now caught. Let's do a potluck. I brought some stuff. Now you bring some stuff. Now Simon Peter, again, is called Simon Peter. Why? Because he's got some unfinished business. He denied the Lord the three times. And he had a private meeting with Jesus already, but this hasn't been fully discussed. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the, to the land full of great fishes. And this is another great topic for a thesis. 153 fish. Now, there's been so much ado about 153. It was once postulated there was 153 species of fish in the Galilee. I don't think that's true. They add up the number. Oh, there's so many different postulates and theories about 153. Ask me, I'll give you an answer. I don't know. All I know is that there was 153 fish, and they were all great fish. And so if you add up the weight, even if there were 10 pounds each or 20 pounds each, you're looking at about 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 pounds of fish in that net. But what I do know is that the net was not broken. God has a blessing for you, my friends. My brothers and sisters, God has a blessing for you. He has a way for you in your life. You need to let go of the past. You need to forgive and forget. Stop. You know, I'm going to tell you, let's just take a break here. So many people say, oh, you know, I had a business and I was this and this and this. My friends, no, no, no. God gave that to you. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. God gracefully gave it to you. Many people say, oh, I was a great mother and I sacrificed and did this. No, 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 no. It wasn't you. It was Jesus inside of you. So many people are so, so much into themselves. We need to be very honest, especially before we break the bread and realize if there's any good in me, it's from the Lord. If I've accomplished anything in my past, it's from the Lord. And if I failed, and yes, I have failed. I have failed often miserably. And so have you. We all have. But look how much Jesus loves us. We need to be reminded again this morning of the love of Jesus. Verse 12. And Jesus said, come and dine. Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask, Who art thou? Because they knew it was the Lord. Verse 13. And Jesus said, Come, take. Come and take. And so he was breaking bread with them. He was having holy communion with them. And he also gave them fish. We are in the new covenant, my friends. The blessings of God 
are far more than we could ever imagine if we learn to get out of the way. It's not what we do. It's the faith that we embrace with God and enjoying his love. Now it says here in verse 14, now this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. I have a question. Where's Jesus? Where has he been all this time? There's a lot of absence among his disciples, among his apostles. Well, my answer to that is that he showed himself to 500 people. And so he's comforting a lot of people. He is encouraging a lot of people. He is visit, visiting a lot of other saints. He loves us all the same. How do you think 120 saints showed up and prayed for 10 days straight right before Pentecost? Who made that possible? Peter? No. It was Jesus. Jesus was telling all and everyone to stay together and pray until the beginning of Pentecost. That's what we see here. I don't know about you, but this story totally captivates my heart and my soul to see how Jesus is preparing breakfast for everyone. You know, I want to finish off here before we close. I made some notes here. Let me see if I can find it here. Yes, here it is. There are five come and sees. There are five. John 1, Jesus says, come and see. Matthew 11, come and learn. Mark 6, come and rest. John 21, come and dine. Matthew 25, come and inherit. You see the order? These are the five times that Jesus said, come. Come and see. Come and learn. Come and rest. And come and dine. And come and inherit. This is a song. It's one of my favorite songs in worship. Now, I'm no singer. And it's okay if you laugh at me. But I'm going to try my best to kind of hum this along before we break the bread. Because I just feel so much love from God right now. I hope you're feeling it too. That he wants to prepare breakfast for you. He wants to have lunch with you. He wants to have dinner with you. He wants to have the ultimate fellowship with you. He said in the scriptures that he wants the Father and the Son to come have sup with you. That's how intimate he wants the relationship to be. So with your permission, accept this feeble, broken voice of mine and know that I'm singing it with love on behalf of all of us to the Lord Jesus before we break the bread and the wine. <clears throat> My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine for thee all the follies of sin i resign my gracious redeemer my savior art thou if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee in life. 
life, and I will love thee in death, and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath, and say when the death do lies cold on my brow, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Let's break the bread. In very basic simplicity, we just take the bread in obedience to Christ, to remember his death and passion. We celebrate him for who he is and what he means to us. And we just simply say to Jesus, I love you. We take the cup. We pray for those who are sick among us. We pray for those who are going for operations in our group. We have someone going for an eye operation. May the Lord bless you and give you full recovery. We have someone who's going for, for brain surgery. We pray that God will be with you as well. There's so many of us that are hurting in many different ways, emotionally, physically, psychologically, financially. Remember, Jesus loves you. He wants to prepare breakfast and lunch and dinner and spend every moment with you. Let go of the past, let go of your sins, and let Jesus come, let his presence be with you always, and let your cup overflow with love and joy. You could feel the presence of Jesus. May that presence of Jesus be with you all day I love you. He loves us ever so much. Have a wonderful day with Jesus.